This morning I want to speak to you on the topic or the subject that I've entitled The Greatest Day in History. The Greatest Day in History. It's in Luke chapter 24. Uh, it's Luke's account of the resurrection. And so uh, we'll be looking at the first 12 verses of Luke's gospel. Chapter 24. Begin reading in verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned to the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the mother of of James and also other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only and he went away to his home marveling at what had happened. The greatest day in history you know, churches do a lot of extra things around uh, Easter and around uh, holidays, uh, especially uh, the resurrection that we celebrate. And we didn't have a Good Friday service this year, but normally churches do have Good Friday services. And down south, they always like to have, a, in a lot of places, they have joint service where several churches come together, and a lot of times it's multiple denominations of Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Catholics all joined together to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. And one year they had a tradition in this town and, and uh, uh, where everybody joined together and they let the Baptist preacher lead it this time. And uh, that Baptist preacher, he was a little, little too proud of his own denomination. And so uh, when he got up to, to start introducing people, uh, he, he just said, how many Baptists do we have here tonight? Well, hands went up all over the place, and there was one little lady sitting there in the front. She didn't raise her hand, and so he couldn't help it. He wanted to poke fun at her, and this preacher said, well, lady, what denomination are you? She said, well, I'm a Methodist. He said, uh, well, why are you a Methodist? She said, well, my grandparents were Methodists. My mother was Methodist. And my late husband was a Methodist, so I'm a Methodist. And so this preacher just couldn't help himself. He said, well, just supposing your relatives had been morons, what would that have made you? She said, I suppose a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> you better be careful what you say sometimes. Uh, I want y'all to know I really blew that joke the first service, so y'all got the good version of it. You know, there's things in Scripture that are hard to believe. The resurrection's one of them. There was an atheist who uh, asked a preacher one time, he said, do you honestly believe that Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights? And the preacher said, well, sir, I don't know. And, and so uh, he said, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And the atheist says, well, what if he's not in heaven? And the preacher said, okay, in that case, you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some things that don't make logical sense. They don't make rational sense, and yet we believe them. And there are some things in the Scripture that are hard to believe. Somebody has rightly said, if you try to explain the resurrection of Jesus, you may lose your mind. But if you deny the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, you may lose your soul. This morning, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the subject for this, this message is the greatest day in history. The central truth of what I'm trying to get across is the greatest day in history makes possible the greatest day of your life. The greatest day in history makes it possible for you to have the greatest day in your life. Now, as we read Luke's account of the resurrection, I want to point out two or three things and we'll be through. The first thing I want you to see is the greatest day in history was filled with great perplexity. It was filled with great perplexity. Now, not long ago, I, I, I was perplexed and uh, I just found out and I thought about how easy it is to perplex me. You know, to be perplexed means you don't have an answer for something or you can't explain something. I sat at a red light, a red light and I'm watching traffic go by. And, you know, I had one of those deep moments of meditation there at the red light. And as a, as a semi came by and it had a company logo on the side of it, I thought to myself, I've never seen that before. I wonder what they do. And then it hit me. I don't know what they do. And then another truck came by with a big piece of machinery on the back. It looked like it was something to do with something. And uh, I had no idea what it was. And so I thought, I wonder what they do with that. And then the thought hit me. I don't know what they do with that. And then I sat there and, and my mind just kept working. And I'm watching cars go by this way and that way. And I thought, I wonder where them people are headed. They're going somewhere. I don't know where they're going. And then the thought hit me, I don't even know who them people are. You know, there's more people I don't know than there is that I do know. And there's more stuff that I don't know than there is that I do know. And I'm sitting at this red light perplexed. And about that time, the person behind me is laying down on the horn. It's, it's time to go. <laughs> perplexed. Perplexed means that, that, that you're at a loss to explain. Uh, you, you, you can't believe your own eyes. Here at the tomb this morning, they see things and they experience things that don't make sense. They can't explain it. First thing I want you to see that was perplexing is the, the missing soldiers and the removed stone was greatly perplexing. Matthew's gospel tells us that the temple leaders had asked the Roman soldiers to put a guard and to seal the tomb. And Matthew says that uh, Pilate sent the guard and he said, go make the tomb secure. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they put a seal over the stone. They, they sealed that thing up and they made it so nobody could get in and nobody could come out. And what happened to those soldiers? Because when the women get there, the soldiers are not there and the stone is rolled away. One gospel tells us that on the way to the tomb, the women are discussing, how are we going to move that big rock? How are we going to get that thing out of the way? Because it was so large. Yet when they arrive at the tomb, the soldiers are gone, the stone is rolled away, the tomb is wide open, and that's perplexing to them. They're asking what happened. And then Matthew's gospel tells us that there was a great earthquake and the angel of the Lord appeared and the stone was rolled away. Somebody said, well, explain how that happened. I can't explain how that happened. All I can tell you is that on that morning, those poor peasant women went to that graveyard and nothing on the scene was like they thought it was going to be. An angel shook the ground and a holy fear of God fell on those Roman soldiers and they scattered like cockroaches when you turned the light on and that heavy stone blew back like a leaf in the wind and Jesus decided to get up and get out and folks, I can't explain it, but that's jaw-dropping perplexing to me. Amen. There was another thing that was perplexing. In verse 4, it says, there's two men, they were angels. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know that I've ever talked to an angel. And some of you might think you're an angel, I don't know, but uh, I, I've, never, I've never known that, and I've never had an angel talk to me. But if I did, I'd be perplexed about it. Angels have several jobs in the Bible. Angels pronounce judgment. Several places in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, you see angels pronouncing God's judgment upon a sinful world. 
Angels declare the holiness of God as they worship. You see them surrounding the throne in the book of Revelation. Myriads of angels, myriads and myriads of angels declaring the praises of God. Angels also bring messages to God's people. Angels brought messages to Abraham and to Daniel and to uh, uh, other people in the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, we read, as angels came and brought God's message. Angels protect God's people. Oftentimes during spiritual warfare, there are things that happen that we can't explain. And sometimes we don't even see that angels are watching over us. There's an unseen battle going on, and angels are taking part in that. Angels appear in the life of Christ at several strategic times. For example, when Jesus was born, the Bible says that the heavenly host appeared in the sky, and the shepherds saw them as they sang in chorus. You may remember as Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat. He did not, he did not drink. And then at the end of it, Satan tempted him. And at the end of the temptation, the Bible says the angels came and ministered to him. And you remember that awful night in Gethsemane as Judas had already gone to get the guards as they had, as Judas had betrayed him. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. The Bible says our Lord and Savior sweat great drops of blood. And then the Bible says the angels came and ministered to him. And so the crucifixion happened. Jesus is nailed to a cross. And he's, he's, he's in the tomb. And now the angels show up. And they frighten away the soldiers. And the angels roll the stone away. And there sitting inside the tomb are angels in dazzling clothes, the Bible says. Now that's perplexing. As I, as, I, as I read about that and I thought about this and I thought to myself, if there would have been a country boy at that tomb, he would have, he would have asked that big angel sitting there. Now, this is just me. But, but, but he would have said, where y'all been? I thought y'all supposed to protect people. I thought y'all supposed to watch over folks. And this is Jesus. Y'all was at his birth. You sang at his birth. You was there in the, in, the, in the temptation. You was there in the garden. But when he was being nailed to a tree with a crown of thorns mashed down on his head, where was y'all? Boy, I thought about that. I know why the angels stood by stoically silent when the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. It's because Jesus said, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And my friend, let me tell you something. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And that's amazing grace, and amazing grace is too perplexing to understand. Amen. There was a third thing that was perplexing. And that is the missing body. The body of Jesus is gone. At first, as the women get there, Mary Magdalene thinks somebody took the body away. John's gospel tells us that uh, Mary, she sees Jesus resurrected, but she mistakes him for the gardener. And she asks, where have they taken him away? And she's weeping. And they have all that going on. And, 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 and that's a normal, rational deduction, right? And, and the reason uh, she doesn't expect to see Jesus alive is because when people die, they stay dead. I mean, death is pretty well final. Death is the ultimate foe. Death is called the king of terrors in the scripture. Death is called the last enemy. And ever since sin entered into the human family, death has passed on from every person all the time, 100%. The Bible says that, Canaan, uh, that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and they had one prohibition, do not eat of the forbidden fruit. On the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
And from that time on, people have been dying. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And Jesus died on the cross. They saw him dead. They witnessed him die the most awful death of any person could suffer. He was hung on a cross, and as he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his head and said, It is finished. And Jesus died. And so that morning, uh, they, they expected to find Jesus' dead body in the tomb. Because why? Because death is final, right? Death keeps its foe, right? That day those mourners came to, the anoint, to anoint the body of Jesus. The soldiers are gone. The grave was open. And the body was gone. And they're speechless. They have no explanation. <laughs> the angel says, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And all I can say is, I can't explain it, but on that great day, the greatest day in history, the devil couldn't stop him, the grave couldn't hold him, death couldn't defeat him, and I'm perplexed about it. I cannot explain it, but here's the good news. I don't have to understand it to believe it, praise God. And you ask me how I know he lives because he lives within my heart and he arose and he's alive and Jesus Christ is alive and because he lives, I have forgiveness of my sins and I have the promise of eternal life and that is why it's the greatest day in history. The second thing I want you to see is the greatest day in history came with a great reminder. Verse 7 says, uh, verse 6 says, he's not here, but he's, re he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you? And then down in verse 8 it says, and they remembered his words. It's kind of like the angel said, <laughs> said uh, don't you remember he told you? Don't you remember he said he was going to be crucified? Don't you remember he said he was going to be buried? And don't you remember he said that he would rise from the grave? Don't you remember that? You know, the promises of Jesus are sometimes hard to remember. They're hard to keep in your heart. Uh, his promises are hard to remember, especially when we get disappointed. Simon Peter got disappointed with Jesus. You remember Simon was following Jesus to the, to the garden and everything, and the soldiers came with Judas, and, and Peter, he pulls out a sword, and he cuts the guy's ear off. And Jesus said, put your sword away, Peter. And Jesus picked that, that bloody ear up out of the dust and stuck it back on and healed the guy. From that point on, Peter was mad at Jesus all the way up through the crucifixion. You say, why? Well, obviously, Peter was disappointed in Jesus. Peter wanted to fight. And Jesus had a different way. Peter wanted to go to war with the Romans. Jesus intended to die for sinners. And you know, it's hard to remember the words of Jesus when we feel like God has let us down. When a loved one dies, it's hard for us to remember his promises. It's tempting to have a lapse of faith when we feel like God has let us down. When, when God doesn't act like we expect him to act, we feel disappointed, we, we get discouraged, and sometimes we want to throw up our hands and walk away. I remember many years ago when I was in Tennessee, um, a man who used to, he was, a, he was a factory worker, but he also had a nice farm. And so he would work the second shift so he could work at night, but he farmed during the daytime. I don't know how many years, several decades he worked at this plant, and the whole time he's talking, he's saying, I can't wait until I can finally retire from this work and don't dedicate my life to farming. He loved to farm. 
And so that great day came. He was going to enjoy his golden years. He was going to retire from that factory. And so he did. And then two weeks after he retired, he was killed in a tragic farming accident. And while his body still lay out in the field, they called me and I got there and it was just pandemonium in the house. People were crying and they were screaming and couldn't believe it. And, and, and if you've ever been in a scene like that, it's just, it's just wild. And I'll never forget that some well-meaning, some, some godly woman, I'm sure, some Christian woman who meant well and had the best intentions, she sat one of, the, one of the family members down in the chair and she took them by the face and she got in their face and she started quoting Bible verses to them. Well, folks, it was like quoting Bible verses to a wall because at that time, under that stress, in that situation, it's hard to remember the promises of Jesus. And on this Sunday morning, these women are at this grave and they're dealing with their feelings of loss and grief and dif disappointment and fear. And it seems impossible that those things Jesus promised could actually happen. So sometimes the promises of Jesus are hard to remember, but the promises of Jesus once remembered will give you hope. Notice it said there in verse 6, remember how he spoke, and then in verse 8 it says, and they remembered his words. I want you to understand something. In this life, we get perplexed and we get confused and we get hurt, and when we don't always have answers, we can always have Jesus. This angel is telling these women everything that happened has been the plan all along. This is not an accident. God is still in control. Jesus said this was going to happen. Don't you remember? Jesus said it was going to happen. It's like the angel saying, see, he told you this was going to happen. Somebody here needs to remember his word today. Somebody in this room right now needs to hear this. The Bible says, Romans 8, 28, God, uh, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Somebody needs to remember that today. Somebody needs to remember that the psalmist said in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Are y'all with me today? Y'all got to help me now. I'm preaching better than y'all listening. On, on this celebration of the greatest day in history, you need to remember his promises. Listen, Psalm 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is for me. I will not fear. And there's somebody here this morning. You're missing a loved one. The years have not diminished the pain of your loss. Time has not erased your grief. And you may not understand why they, that your loved one left this world when they did. And can you remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, yet will he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Somebody needs to remember this morning that he arose a victor or the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. And on the greatest day in history, Jesus Christ defeated death and because he lives, you believe and you will experience a great day when one of these days you are going to see that loved one that your heart has been aching to see all these years and he's going to be standing there in the Shekinah glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus, I don't know if he's going to say this or not, but he just just might look at you and say, see, I told you. <laughs> great perplexity, great reminder. Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead, and he did. And then finally, the greatest day in history offers us a great opportunity to begin again. To begin again. I read to you there where the ladies come back, the women come back from the tomb, and they they're perplexed. They said, Jesus risen from the grave. And those women rush back to the apostles and they report. And it says in verse 11, the words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. Now, there was a time in my life, 
probably you, maybe you're still there. There was a time when the Word of God seemed like nonsense to me. You say, well, why is that? Seems like nonsense because my mind, my eyes were blinded by, by the devil. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world, talking about the devil, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The devil blinds people's eyes to the goodness of God. The devil blinds people's eyes to the truth in Jesus. Have you ever noticed how the devil can make bad look good and good look bad? We see this all the time. Most children think their parents are bad and their knucklehead friends are good. And we know better. Uh, well, most, most commercials trying to get you to do something bad presents the bad in such fun and the good as such a drag. That's the, way, that's the way it operates. And because we're spiritually blind, we don't, we don't see the truth in God's Word sometimes. But then there was an intellectual cause for doubt. When I say intellectual, I mean our rational faculties have a hard time reasoning how it is that God can create the world by His spoken Word. We, we, we have a hard time to understand how it is that the Red Sea could split and the children of Israel could cross on. I, I, heard, a, I heard a liberal a theologian one time explaining how God got the children of Israel across. He said, it wasn't really a miracle. He said what happened was that uh, the creek was really down and the rocks were sticking up and Moses found a spot where they could tiptoe across on the rocks and they got all on the other side. That's what happened. And I thought, well, it was a bigger miracle than I thought because when the Egyptians came, God drowned them in that little bit of water. Hallelujah. But this, this intellectual thing, this, this rational trying to understand is all going on in the minds of the apostles. How could it be possible after a person has been beaten, abused, bloodied, and crucified on a Roman cross, how is it possible, it's impossible that he could be alive? So they don't believe what the women say. But the greatest day in history is not finished yet. Jesus gave them an opportunity to change their minds. I was, I was reading recently about police in Idaho. Now, this is about somebody in Idaho. Uh, if you're from Idaho, this is not about people in Idaho. But uh, the, 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 the police in Idaho stopped this young lady uh, and gave her a ticket, gave her a traffic ticket. Seems like she was driving around the block backwards in reverse. She made multiple trips. And uh, they watched her several times and they said, uh, you can't do that, it's against the law, but why are you doing that? She said, well, my father is so mad about me putting so many miles on the car, I was trying to unwind them. <laughs> Well, it'd be nice if we could unwind some of our life, wouldn't it? Just, just kind of get in reverse and get in a time. But you can't do that. I mean, what you've done is water under the bridge. You can't, you can't undo what has been done. But the good news is we can start again. You see, uh, it's impossible to undo what, what, what we have done, but... But through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he allows us to start a brand new life. Listen to what it says in Luke 24, later on in the chapter. Toward the end of the chapter, it says this. Jesus appeared to them. They had been doubting. Jesus appeared to them while they were in the upper room. And he said to them, look at my hands. Look at my feet and see who I am. Touch me and find out for yourselves. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones as you see I have. And after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. The disciples were so glad and amazed that they could not believe it. And Jesus then asked them, do you have something to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish. And he took it and ate it as they watched. They're just amazed. Ghosts don't eat fish. Everybody knows that, right? 
Something that happened so hard to believe their rational mind could not grasp it. But when they saw the crucified hands and the nail-pierced feet, and they saw him eating, what they could not believe with their rational mind, Jesus revealed to them in their spirit. Now, Jesus reveals himself to unbelievers so that they can become believers. And this is how you become a follower of Jesus. Do you realize that if you'll change your mind about Jesus, it will change your life forever? Do you see that's the greatest thing you can do is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? There, there, there are spiritual mysteries. There are spiritual occurrences that happen to people. Scripture calls the greatest thing that can happen to any of us spiritual birth or being born again. It's when a person comes to know in their heart, in their heart of hearts, in their deepest heart, that there was one, the Lord Jesus, who died, and that he was buried, and that he rose from the grave, and that he is Savior and Lord. And that is reality that you know that you know. It is a spiritual awakening that instantly and powerfully reorients a person's life. Spiritual birth or being born again is an act of divine grace. It is something God does for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And when a person is born of the Spirit, they are forever more changed from that point forward. And I would just ask you this morning, has the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to you? Have you experienced spiritual birth? You say... I wish I could preach good enough. I wish I could preach hard enough. I wish I could be so intellectual as to convince every person I talk to. But I know that it's not an intellectual thing. I know that it's a spiritual thing. And until God opens up your spiritual eyes and reveals himself to you, you don't know what I'm talking about. But maybe this morning God has spoken to your heart and you've come to the point where you realize that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And you have trusted Christ as your Savior. I wish I could tell you how to do it, but nobody can. All we can tell you is, if it's happened to you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Let me just close by saying, we're talking about a new chance. One day, uh, when I was in Tennessee, there was a man who was visiting our church. He had, he had come two or three times, and I had been working at the church uh, one Saturday morning, and uh, we, we were building a church building, and when we got a break, I told one of our deacons that was working with me, I said, let's go visit this guy. He's been coming to our church. Let's go, go by and see him. He said, all right. So we'll go over to this guy's house, and he wasn't home. And so I lived about 12 miles from the church. I got in my truck, and I went on home. And when I got home, uh, back then we didn't have cell phones. But there was something ringing on the wall, and I picked it up, and uh, it was a telephone, and it was that deacon. And he said, uh, this guy that we had went to visit, he said, you need to come. He said, he's been walking around up at, up, there was a junkyard close to where he lived. He'd been walking around in the junkyard telling people up there, he's going to hell, and he don't know what to do about it. You need to come and talk to him. I said, I'll be right there. So I went and got in my truck, and I drove back up there, and I got to his house. We go in the house, and there he sat with his wife and his little boy. And he's sitting there just like, you know, he'd call a, con a convention or something. He's sitting there. I go in, and I said, I noticed you've been coming to our church. And he said, yeah. He said, can you tell me how to not go to hell? And I said, well, yes, I can. He said, well, I'm glad you can because I've been to about six different churches and nobody's telling me I'd not go to hell. And I said, well, all right, but do you mind me asking you, what brought about all this concern? He, he got started. He said, Pastor, let me tell you something. He said, five years ago, I had open heart surgery. And he said, while I was under the anesthesia, I don't know if I died. I don't know what happened. They had to shock me to bring me back alive. But he said, while I was in that state, he said, I had a vision. And he said, I, I, I believe I saw Jesus. And he said, Jesus told me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you to hell. 
And he said, I begged him, please don't send me to hell. Let me go back. Let me go back. And he said, I promised Jesus if he had let me go back, I would turn my life over to him. And he said, preacher, that was five years ago. He said, I woke up. And he said, you know what? I never did start serving Jesus. I never did live up to my word. And he said, the other night I had a dream. And he said, in that dream, Jesus told me, it's time. You, you didn't follow through. He said, I'm taking you and I'm sending you to hell. And then he got excited and he started jumping up and down. He said, preacher, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. I said, well, you want me to tell you how to not go to hell? He said, yes. He sat down at the table. I said, do you realize Jesus Christ died on the cross for you to pay your sin debt? And that he was buried and on the third day he rose again? And that he offers a free pardon because of what he did for you on the cross, not for what you did for him, but because what he did, he finished the work. And if you'll trust solely in him for your salvation and repent of your sins and turn your life over to him, you will not go to hell, but you'll spend eternity in heaven. I said, would you like to say a prayer right now and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? He said, I absolutely would. And before we started praying, his wife said, well, can I get saved too? I said, absolutely. And the boy sitting there said, can I get saved too? I said, absolutely. And I said, listen, I want to lead you in a prayer. And I said, dear Lord Jesus. And he said, dear Lord Jesus. And man, it was like kickstarting a Honda. He took off, man. I tell you what, he started praying and I didn't have to say another word. For 15 minutes, he prayed and repented of sin. And when he got done, he said, amen. And he opened his eyes and he goes, whew. And he was a farmer, and he said, have you ever seen one of them big old inner tubes when you just let all the air out of it? Yeah. He said, that's the way I feel. All the air has been let out. <laughs> and that man experienced the resurrected Christ. And Jesus gave him a second chance. And I'm going to tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave on the greatest day in history. And that is because that was the day he atoned for our sins. That was the day he defeated death. That was the day he validated all his claims. That day, Jesus Christ rose from the grave, made it possible for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord to be saved. The greatest day in history the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ made it possible for whosoever to be saved. And here's the thing. The greatest day in history makes it possible for you to experience your greatest day. Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you have yet to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to. I'm asking you to right now. Would you just bow your head, close your eyes. Everybody just bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you've yet to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I, I, I'm not asking you if you've ever been a church member or got baptized somewhere or something. I'm asking you, have you experienced the new birth? Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins? If not, then I'm, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And you just pray in your heart what you'd like to say to the Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, I am sorry I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life and change my heart. And I want to live for you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, Today is the day of salvation. And so as we celebrate the greatest day in history, why not make it the greatest day of your life by trusting Jesus as your Savior? Would you all stand with me? As our instrumentalists begin to play,
If you need to come, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior, would you just step right out and come right on down?